I think um, it's nearly uh, seven o'clock. Um, so Anas, if you can start the broadcast on YouTube um, and then seven o'clock, uh, just make a start and uh, inshallah uh, during it, we'll be chasing. We've sent him the link on WhatsApp as well, haven't we? Okay, I'm starting now. Okay. All right, so I'm going on mute now. Yeah. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن ولا dear brothers sisters friends السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته and welcome to this very special uh, unique evening um, uh, with Cage on YouTube live and on Zoom uh, it is seven o'clock here in uh, BST and inshallah we have to, we hope to have very very soon um, the former Taliban uh, ambassador to Pakistan, as well as the uh, former spokesman for the Taliban, Mullah Abdul Salam Zaif, who is the author of a book called, if you haven't read it, I suggest that you do, called My Life with the Taliban. Um, and it is something that, oh, that keeps disappearing, uh, but there you go. It is something, it is a book that I highly, highly recommend uh, that you can get off Amazon. Um, and of course, we have Sister Yvonne Ridley, uh, who also really needs little introduction, but she is also, um, in addition to being a journalist, an author, an activist, a campaigner, a friend uh, of all of those who stand up uh, and believe in rights and dignity, she was also a prisoner, a captive in the hands of the Taliban. Uh, and she's written a book about that. Uh, captured by the Taliban, which I think is still available in print, still available. Um, but she's also with us. Can can we get Sister Yvonne on? Uh, are you there, Sister Yvonne? Let's see. Has she joined us? I know she's there. Yes, I am. I'm here. Okay. Can you put your video on? Um. I thought it was on. Okay, um, if it is, I don't see it. Right, uh, can you see oh, me I now? See. Sorry, sorry. Yes. I see, yes, yes, mm -hmm. I see. I see, mashallah. Yes, yeah, so Sister Yvonne is with us and it's a great pleasure to have you here. Uh, Thank you. Alaykum wa Allah. Wa alaykum salam, Mozan. Um, and so we are waiting to get uh, Abdul Sheikh Abdul Salam Zaif to join us. Um, 
He's actually in Istanbul at the moment um, on some meetings, but he is, he hopefully should be joining us very, very shortly. Um, so we might as well get straight into it, uh, Yvonne. <clears throat> mm -hmm. uh, I, I was going to ask you about, uh, and I wanted to do this when Abdul Salam Zaif is here, so perhaps I might wait, but I know that you had an encounter with him um, many, many years ago when you were first taken into captivity. I'm going to leave him to say, inshallah, when he comes on, what he thought of you. But what did you think of him and the others uh, that you met? Well, the very first time I met him was it was from a distance. It was the first ever major press conference of the Taliban. And it was in Islamabad. And I think they set out a room in the embassy for about 12 or so people and hundreds turned up and they had to move the press conference out into a garden because the embassy building wasn't safe to hold that many journalists and their crews. And so we were outside and I remember Mullah Zaif um, began talking and one of the loudspeakers that uh, they put into a tree fell down and hit a Japanese reporter on the head who was standing next to me. And I said, oh, look, the first casualty of war. And quite a few people sniggered nearby. And uh, I don't know whether he'll remember, but I remember him looking over and he was really stern as you would be if you had uh, America banging the drums of war towards your country, which at that time the war hadn't started. It was, um, it was September time. I had been to the Taliban embassy three times to try and get a visa to go into Afghanistan, but they refused. And in fact, they kicked out all of the Western journalists uh, from um, Afghanistan and it was um, obviously for the, the Afghans a very fraught time. They uh, were being held accountable for 9-11 even though there were no hijackers from the Taliban on board any of the aircraft that uh, went into the Twin Towers or hit the Pentagon or um, on, on that day and uh, it was quite a, a fraught, fraught time and they had <laughs> by that time been demonised in the media very much the language that we've been hearing these past few weeks it was like that um, in 2001 and it had actually begun in 1996 when America had walked away from Afghanistan and it stopped funding um, any activities at all and that is when the demonization process began about this brutal evil regime. Okay uh, brothers and sisters uh, everybody who's watching we, uh, we we aim to be here for about an hour or, or a little a uh, little over an hour uh, so those of you who want to go and, and pray Maghrib, inshallah, you will be able to do so. Uh, but in the meantime, um, we, we're talking about Afghanistan. We're talking about the legacy of the United States in Afghanistan. And we're talking about the future of Afghanistan and what that holds, what that means for Afghanistan, its neighboring countries, and for the rest of the world. So Sister Yvonne, you were there at the beginning. I know I was there when the Taliban uh, were in power. I was running a, a girls' school. Um, and I saw the... No, no, no. You can't have been running a girls' school, Moazam. According to the BBC, there were no girls' schools in Afghanistan. Yeah, well, I, I beg to differ with the BBC and everybody else because uh, um, we were there. Um, and that's the point. That's one of the points, isn't it? That uh, mm -hmm. when you talk about Afghanistan at that time and even now, it's one of the things that's constantly thrown at us that we get to hear... Um, the, the Taliban are, will ban the education, will not allow schools. And I'm witness to the fact that we opened a girls' school there. We had vehicles that would pick up the children uh, and take them to their schools on a normal daily school run 
picking them up, bringing them back home as part of the school bus system, which went to the girls' school. The school, the school was called Khadija Tabin Khwailid School uh, for girls. So um, when, every time I bring this up uh, and mention it to people within the media, they quickly go on to the next subject and don't mm -hmm. address it. I mean, you were involved in, I remember setting up a, 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 uh, a library for girls, um, I remember, uh, it was about 2010, and, and Imran mm -hmm. Khan was, was actually at that fundraiser. Yes. Um, what was that about? Tell us about that. It was a, a girls' library in Jalalabad, and uh, it, was, um, it was a project of mine because I just... Uh, I've been back to Afghanistan a few times, and... Apart from the girls or women living in the major cities like uh, Kabul and Kandahar, the girls in the countryside, the rural areas, um, they're not getting very much of an education at all. In fact, there are still about um, 3.2 million kids that are not being educated in Afghanistan and because of the instability of the country, um, that increased to about 10 million at la last year. These are all official figures. But I, I just wanted to get this girls library up and running um, just to help give the girls a leg up. As it turned out, the project is still in the, um, in the pipeline. And, um, you know, it's something that I am going to make sure um, is, uh, is completed because uh, I'm working class and, and whenever I go abroad and, and travel around, I like to engage with similar classes. And uh, the working class women in Afghanistan have got no voice. Millions of them, they have no voice. We okay, hear. Sorry, I just wanted to say on that. I mean, just you, you were talking about statistics. One particular thing mm -hmm. before we move on to the, uh, another subject is um, a shocking statistic. According to a report I've read, um, I think to the United Nations, it says that approximately eighty-five percent of the women of Afghanistan are illiterate. Now that's a figure that's 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 present during mm -hmm. and after the occupation. So what did the occupation do for rights of ordinary people, let alone women? and education in particular? Well, it would be churlish not to acknowledge that there are women um, judges and, and there were uh, women professionals and politicians. But, you know, these were largely from the elite privileged classes <clears throat> who would rise upwards whatever is, is going on in a country. And um, the exact figure is actually 84% of um, Afghan women are illiterate. And this is after 20 years of a US NATO occupation in which, you know, these guys went in to rescue the Afghan women. Uh, there are no career women emerging from the rubble in the far-flung areas of Afghanistan. They don't have a voice. And, and here's another statistic to throw at you. Um, while more men than women in countries around the world commit or attempt suicide, in Afghanistan, it is the reverse. It's the only country in the world where more women than men attempt or commit suicide. And it's a taboo subject, but there is about 3,000 recorded every year. And of those 3,000, 80% are women. It's an astonishing statistic because the trend is reversed in every country in the world apart from Afghanistan. So 20 years of occupation, you know, these are shameful statistics. And um, I, I, it, it's all, all the women in the working class areas, the villages, the, uh, the, they don't have a voice. They've got a pretty miserable life. Um, and it's not 
because of the men in their lives. It's because of the circumstances of a country which has been occupied by invading forces twice in the last 45 years, throw in some famines, um, civil war, continual strife. And, uh, you know, it's a terrible picture. And it's these are the women that I'm really concerned about. Okay, so uh, I have, can you all hear me? Oh, can you hear me? Yes. I have um, uh, just spoke to Abdus Salam Zaif. Hopefully he's joining us very, very soon. He's here. He's definitely here. Um, and he'll be joining us from Turkey. Uh, and so before he does that, uh, let me tell everybody, uh, if you want to ask any of the questions, please do so in the Q&A and not in the chat. It's hard to kind of uh, monitor all the comments they're in. Uh, there are people from the cage team who are answering questions that are kind of organic or, or, or general about particular things. Um, we as cage are in the process of setting up something known as the International Witness Campaign, which will be a uh, uh, 40 organizations from, from, uh, 50 from 15 different countries around the world uh, that will document, talk about, uh, and deal with issues pertaining to the war on terrorism and the 20 year legacy. It's a period of time that we will get former soldiers, academics, uh, journalists, and everybody that's been involved in uh, uh, talking about war on terrorism. So please do join that and you'll see the links in, uh, in the chat. Uh, Sister Yvonne, you have been to Afghanistan many times as we've already said. Um, hopefully we'll get uh, Mullah Abdus Salam talking about this, but you came to Bagram prison and behind me is, a, is one of the images of Bagram prison. I was mm -hmm. held as a captive for almost 11 months and I witnessed some of the most brutal, horrific treatment that I'd seen in the entirety of my time in Guantanamo and in custody uh, of the US. I heard the sounds of a woman screaming, which you know, and I told you about that many times, um, which I thought I was led to believe for a period of time was my wife. Um, and we discovered later that there was a prisoner, uh, prisoner 650 in, held in Bagram. You went, you did a full investigation. You did a, an exemplary investigation into, into the case of Afia Siddiqui and asked, uh, the governors, the chiefs of police who were present in Ghazni, um, about all of that. What brought you, you, you named, you gave a name, that was your name that, that you gave to the woman of Bagram. What brought you to Bagram and why? What, what was going through your head? That was, um, the, the name I gave was the Grey Lady of Bagram because I knew that there was a woman there. The Americans denied having a woman there. You told me about hearing a woman scream and I thought, well, maybe it's a tape recording. Then I set off and, and spoke to various eyewitnesses, um, fellow prisoners of yours who um, not only heard a woman screaming, they saw her. And I spoke to one particular witness, Dr. Berhardt, who was in the next cell to this woman and it turned out to be Afia. And there has been some compelling evidence that she was held in there. And I found witnesses to the actual shooting in the prison in Gardez. And, and uh, this, um, None of those witnesses were called for the trial in America, which I still think um, is an illegal trial. It had no jurisdiction. The alleged crime happened in Afghanistan. So essentially, you know, the Americans, they can't help themselves. She was kidnapped, renditioned and hauled off to America to um, a trial that had no jurisdiction. And, and um, I still can't understand how, despite all of that, um, she didn't walk away a free woman because all the science said that she did not pick up a gun and fire it. All the science said that. Um, the defense team had an open goal and, and they still managed to lose the case. Of course, 
it was an incendiary time. Uh, the, the trial was held in the shadows of where the Twin Towers had once stood. Um, and, and the, you know, the American people were in a state of shock. It, it took them years to recover from 9-11. Um, psychologically, they were shattered. It was the first time in their history that America had been invaded, um, apart from when the Brits burned down the White House, but some hundreds, few hundred years ago. But, but this was really psychologically, uh, she was never going to get a fair trial. And, and um, I, I just wish that the, you know, if there was any justice in the world today, she should be released. Yeah, um, I mean, to just to, uh, uh, to update people, those who don't know, Afia was recently assaulted in uh, Carswell, uh, FMC Carswell prison by another inmate. And uh, she says that uh, uh, she's lucky. She, she praises Allah that she, uh, I was, was saved. Um, brothers and sisters, uh, Mullah Abdul Salam Zaif, I, I can assure you he's, he's there. He's trying to join. He's just having some technical difficulties, uh, but he is, he is here as in he's, he's around. Um, so inshallah, we, he will join us, but please do keep your questions uh, and uh, comments coming. We'll try and answer whatever we can uh, in the chat uh, in, uh, and the rest, hopefully, uh, if you put them into the, uh, the Q&A. So Sister Involv, Afghanistan, uh, answer me this question. There are so many people who are on, traditionally on supporters of kind of anti-imperialism, as it were. Um, who support the idea, the concept of uh, fighting, defeating uh, a foreign invader, an occupier. It's a, it's a, a, it's a right under international law. It's a right, right mm -hmm. under the law of the jungle. So why the reluctance of some people who are anti-imperialists to essentially, if nothing else, to uh, welcome a Taliban victory and the withdrawal stroke defeat of the United States of America against a poor nation, against a poor group of um, people who are nowhere near as, as, uh, as, as advanced as them. Why is that, do you think? Well, there's been a, a reluctance to um, acknowledge anything positive about the Taliban. There's been such a demonization job in the media. In fact, it's so bad now that even the media are beginning to believe their own publicity. Um, but, you know, occupations never last forever. Every occupation has to come to an end. It's like the law of gravity. What goes up must come down. And it's the same with um, occupation and perhaps this is something that the Israelis should take note of. What disappoints me about um, the uh, fall of uh, this latest occupation is, uh, you know, I'm a feminist and, and I just don't know how feminists around the world can wring their hands and bemoan the NATO forces um, leaving because th this is, um, you know, I, I just can't see how you can support an imperialistic venture. And uh, all of the bombs and bullets that have been dropped um, have killed women and children as well as a perceived enemy. And the Americans, we know through your case, through many cases, um, men have been taken away, they've been brutalized, they've been tortured. You saw an Afghan guy being kicked to death in Bagram. You know, all these men have wives, daughters, mothers. Why on earth would a woman want to support that sort of brutal occupation? Yeah. And, and uh, this is something that's lost in the, um, the Western sisterhood. You know, that uh, all these men that, that were captured and shipped off to um, 
Guantanamo, including the the 94 year old shepherd and the the uh, nine or 10 year old boy who was tending some sheep as well, all shipped off to um, Guantanamo. You know, they, they're all somebody's son, somebody's husband, somebody's um, uncle, brother. So many women were affected by this uh, this occupation. And, and so, it's a, 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 you know, I'm at a loss really at, at uh, the reaction of some feminists who would rather support this um, macho fueled invasion and occupation. There's a WikiLeaks um, uh, cable that came out in which which I saw that uh, released that the, that the CIA, as part of its program, actually said that we need to use a, utilize feminism in order to demonize the enemy. So it was actually a it it was a it was a uh, part of the plan, as it were. Yeah, uh, men using women, men exploiting women yet again, and they <laughs> and they fell for it. And I it it's absolutely infuriating but um you know we we see that and and uh the only voices that we're hearing at the moment in afghanistan are articulate english-speaking um privileged elite women who um have had the benefit of, of uh, a wonderful education and they're the ones uh who are talking what the mainstream media is not doing is speaking to other women, engaging other women who haven't been as privileged, who aren't living um, in a nice home in a compound. And, and uh, you know, maybe they should um, speak to them for an alternative voice. Although I did speak to a Canadian, well, she has a Canadian passport. She. Um, her family fled when she was one year old and she returned in 2018. And when the Taliban arrived in uh, Kabul, her family, who still live in Canada, called her and said, get out, get out quickly. You've got to get uh, back to Canada. You've got to come home. And she said, no, this is my home and I am done running. I'm not going to be scared anymore. And she has started a hashtag campaign please stay and she's absolutely a breath of fresh air to listen to and and um you know because this whatever else is happening in afghanistan um you know you might think well let everybody run off and good riddance to them the problem is you know this is a brain drain and and um and so they should be encouraged to try and stay or, or wait and see. But she is, and she's a remarkable woman. And uh, I was listening to BBC radio this morning and they were talking to um, a doctor who's worked in a, uh, an amputee clinic for the last 30 years. He's an Italian. And he started uh, talking, uh, no, I'm not afraid. I, I was here the first time round. I'm sure they'll be better this time round. Well, um, I suppose all the women uh, that you employed, you know, I suppose they've all gone. And he said, no, he said, they're still here. And he said, and actually women were working um, the first time round. And of course, this, there was this, uh, radio silence about five seconds which is a long time for radio because of course the BBC as well as promoting the lie there were no girls schools have also said women weren't allowed to work so and okay. women were allowed to work so sorry guys I'm I, I'm still not sure what's happening with Abdul Salam I, I, I did speak to him moments ago um he, he is he, he is supposed to be here I don't know what's happening but we He's we'll probably on. seen me and thought, oh, my goodness, it's her again. <laughs> beyond the, not beyond the realm of possibility, but I don't think so. I think he'd be happy. You know, just bearing that in mind, Yvonne, um, what, what do the Taliban, as a journalist, what do the Taliban need to do? 
because clearly what you've got here is an onslaught from Western media and other, other aspects of the media. I'm thinking the Arab world, they're a little bit more receptive um, because they've seen what happens with the destabilization of countries, the invasion of, of the United States of America and the allies. And people want to see two things. They want to see somebody, you know, for, with the best respect in the world to, to, to expel the occupier. But at the same time, they want peace as a result, not to expel the occupier and then more war, expel the occupier and then present, as I think the Taliban have attempted to do, the hand of peace to those who essentially collaborated with the occupation. But what do they need to do and, and um, to get their voice heard and understood? At the moment, for example, there's organizations like Facebook, which are literally taking people off Facebook for posting stuff interviews on, in some cases, mainstream media connected to the Taliban. They've got an uphill struggle. What, what as a journalist, do you think they should do? Well, they played a blinder when they held the press conference because, you know, everybody was sitting there waiting for them. Maybe they thought they would open it up with a public flogging or uh, something. But instead, uh, they came... And, and they spoke to a mixed media and said, peace, reconciliation, forgiveness, and, and women's rights. You know, the Taliban talking about women's rights, incredible. What they have to do now is follow up these fine words with deeds. Let's see those words turn into action. But the other thing that, um, I mean, they're much more media savvy than they were. And, and, and the Taliban Mark I, as I called them from the, the 90s, couldn't give, uh, couldn't care less what anybody was saying about them. Um, the court of public opinion was of absolutely no interest to them. Uh, they were very focused on what they wanted to do and couldn't care less what people and weren't even aware of what people were saying about them. This Taliban are much more media savvy. They've had 20 years to think about what they did wrong, how they can improve. And, um, and obviously, you know, sitting in Qatar, Qatar has... Um, played uh, a wonderful host. I've got no doubt that they've introduced um, the Taliban leadership there to some equally media savvy people who might have been able to advise them. And, and also uh, Sheikh Karadawi, um, different ideology, but hugely respected. He hosted uh, some of them last year at his home. And, um, and I'm sure that all of this has rubbed off, has influenced. I don't think they'll dilute their Islam at all, but I think they will soften. And, uh, and, and we saw the beginnings of that at the, at the press conference. But what I would do if I was them, I would get a rebuttal unit in place to call out and fact check every little bit of fake news that's there because there's some and and you can see where a lot of the tweets are coming from and being retweeted it's almost on an industrial scale india is it's pushing out all of this fake news uh, there's an image of a helicopter with a man uh, dangling from a rope and he's waving um, but according to the Indian media, the Taliban have publicly hung somebody and, and they're showing his body off to the world. Well, of course, these images are just 10 seconds and then people are going oh, and, and retweeting it. Um, we were when the, the day after the Taliban arrived, we had pictures of three women in black abayas walking down the street with a man. Um, holding on to a chain, pulling them, and they had chains around their ankles. This photograph was a Reuters photograph, and it was taken in Iraq about 15 years ago. 
and the ankle chains were actually photoshopped on. But that's the sort of nasty stuff that's coming out. Some of the fake news is more subtle. And as, as I say, you know, the, the, the lie about the girls' schools still perpetuates today to such an extent that the BBC has now got itself into a cul-de-sac because, it, you know, what does it do? Does it turn around and say, we've lied for 20 years or we've been misled for 20 years or we never checked our facts? for 20 years you know it's it's um they've really boxed themselves in but what the um the taliban should do is just get a little rebuttal unit four or five um savvy people to uh pick up each, each thing that comes out and and name and shame the media organization that's perpetuating these lies like when the, the day after the Taliban arrived, we saw one journalist, and I'm so angry with her because um, I really respected her. Um, she put on a, a black abaya, and um, whereas before she just wandered around freely, you know. Just, I don't know exactly who you're talking about. So. Well, I don't want to name it, but I'm just so annoyed. But anyway, and, and she stood in front of the camera, in front of these jubilant uh, Afghan soldiers who were shouting, Takbir, Allahu Akbar. And she looked straight into the camera and she said, oh, this is weird. They're now saying death to America. And I went, oh. so I, you know, run, run it back. I was watching live, run it back on the TV. And run it back again. I ran, run it back three times because I thought, well, maybe she's heard something that I haven't. And it, it just wasn't there. Yeah, and right. this, this right. sort of BS is, is really um, frustrating. Okay, so there's something else that I, I picked up. And again, media is really not talking about it at all. So the Kabul airport attack, we know that ISIS Khorasan, ISIS K, an offshoot of ISIS, which in itself was created as a result of the invasion of Iraq, which in itself came because of the torture uh, of Ibn al Sheikh al Libya and the false, the false evidence. But they carried out, uh, uh, the Taliban get intelligence that an attack is imminent. They pass that information on to mm -hmm. the Brits, the Americans. Um, the Brits and the Americans, including the leadership of, of both, actually put it out. They say that right, and there's an impending attack. Taliban soldiers are still at their posts and don't move from their posts knowing that there's intelligence of an attack and it's likely to be a, a suicide attack. Mm -hmm. We hear about the 13 Americans, Marines who got killed. Uh, the second part is the Afghans who get killed. But amongst the Afghans who get killed are 28 Taliban fighters. Mm -hmm. And there's no mention of it because these Taliban fighters, by default, their, their, their job, their post, their orders are to remain where you are and guard the civilians, the U.S. perimeter, and by extension, the U.S. soldiers. Why do you think this is not a story worth telling uh, for the media? Was it just too obvious? Uh, th they were just in... Um... That they can't bear to say anything nice or anything not even nice, uh, just factual about the the Taliban. And I I was pleased when the Americans were leaving, and the head of the American military he did say. Um, he did acknowledge that the Taliban had their backs and they wouldn't have been able to have made their evacuation as smoothly as they did without the Taliban um, guarding the uh, perimeter of the airport. I mean, the head of the Joint Chiefs of Staff here in the UK, Nick Carter, who mm -hmm. had 55,000 uh, troops, NATO troops in Afghanistan, actually said that the Taliban are like, you know, good old country boys with a code of honor. Um, 
who want an inclusive government and we should mm. be careful about calling them now our enemies. So he's, he's, he's attacked for that. If you do a search on him, you yeah. won't find many uh, headline stories with that. So even there's an active uh, sort of effort by the media to even downplay uh, military leaders who have uh, something good to say. I had to smile as he was trying to explain the concept of uh, Pashtun Wali to uh, the Sky News presenter because uh, this code of honour was just totally over her head. Um, and it, it's uh, some of the... Some of the comments have been absolutely virulent. Um, I'm thinking of another female commentator, and you know, she uh, was was talking about uh, these primitive, uh, backward, uh, violent uh, thugs who go around in rape gangs attacking women. And I just thought, you know, everything there is just a total lie. But in, in some ways, because the media have been spinning this all this time, um, it, it's probably permeated into the establishment. Into Well, it has permeated into the parliament. We saw lots of British MPs standing up uh, repeating this garbage because this is what they've read or they've heard and you know again no fact checking at all and in some ways that will actually have helped the Taliban because while everybody's been muttering about this um, brutal evil primitive regime the Taliban have got on with the business of getting their country back you know, and they've um, picked up a few laptops and, and uh, iPads and, and have moved with the times. And while everybody else is calling them medieval and brutal, and you know, they've actually been quite sophisticated in what they've done to, to get Afghanistan back. And now um, these same commentators are saying, they they don't know how to run a country, when in fact they've been running a huge chunk of Afghanistan quietly, efficiently, um, in the south for the last five ten years, right. where so, they've so. Est established courts and and uh, sorted out disputes on the ground and and taken taxes and and um, have been running areas. Okay, uh, so, a government, uh, brothers and sisters. Unfortunately, it seems to me I don't know what's happened with Abdul Salam Zaif. I'm, I'm still hoping, still hopeful that he will join us. Um, if it doesn't happen, if for whatever reason we will reschedule, schedule, and I hope, inshallah, um, that Sister Yvonne can join us because I just can't wait to see that, um, you know, that chemistry uh, of, of these two uh, former former foes, or even if they were kind of kind of amicable foes. Um, meeting on, on, uh, on our platform. But uh, before we go, I want to go into some questions that, that are not for Sheikh Abdul Salam Zaif. But I, before I do that, I want to ask, uh, so the Taliban now have inherited um, roads, whatever the Americans built. There's something that I heard somebody say is that what the, the American building program as opposed to the Soviet program, Soviets built everything in brick, concrete and mortar, like the Bagram Air Base. What they said, what, and perhaps it's a bit of an exaggeration, but Americans built everything uh, that wasn't built to last. They built it out of wood uh, and plastic. Um, and But despite that, they've left behind uh, military hardware to the value of about $89 billion from what I've read. And if that is true, um, the Taliban now uh, are in possession of all of this, uh, weapons, Black Hawk helicopters, thousands of Humvees and so forth. Where do you think they're going to get the technology and the ability to maintain this stuff, to, uh, to, to use this stuff and to protect their country um, from what may come from ISIS, from disgruntled 
uh, government members, from people who don't accept uh, their their rule, and and others. How do you think they're going to do this? Um, well, it, how did they take on the biggest superpower in the world and win with AK forty sevens and sandals and shalwar kameez? Um, this is a wonderful problem for them to have. Uh, it's quite clear the Russians and the Chinese are going to be very willing to help them. And uh, I'm sure that uh, having seen how innovative and enterprising uh, the Palestinians in Gaza are uh, when it comes to equipment and getting things up and running, um, I'm quite confident they'll probably do the same. I know a lot of the equipment at the airport was demilitarized, which was a euphemism for a wrecking spree um, that they set about um, rendering some of the aircraft and, and uh, helicopters incapable. But the Taliban have inherited just about the largest Black Hawk fleet of helicopters in the region. Um, of course, in an ideal world, they would probably need uh, the Americans to come back and, and um, maintain this. But I think that they would rather see them rot than, uh, than ask um, the Americans uh, for help in that way. Okay. I just I, I just don't think it's a huge problem. I mean, it's like somebody leaving a Rolls Royce on your drive, Moazam, and taking the keys. I'm sure you'd find a way to start it. Brilliant. <laughs> Great analogy. OK, let me go some questions because a lot of lots of questions. Lots of people have joined us from from both Zoom and from from um, uh, YouTube. So uh, there's a question here. Um, by Ibrahim Makda, he says, are the Taliban oppressing the Hazaris, the Hazaras and other minorities? Um, I'll let you answer something about that and I'll answer something mm -hmm. what I know. Yeah, they did, without a doubt, they did. Um, Taliban Mark II are being much more inclusive mm -hmm. and, uh, and they are reaching out. They've said to the Hazara, we want representation of you in our government. They've said it to the Tajiks and the Uzbeks, um, all, all of the minority groups um, that they want to create a government that reflects the diversity of Afghanistan. And I think that this is something that they may have picked up in Qatar to accept people's differences, to respect those differences um, and, and to move on. And um, as I say, last year, some of them uh, were invited to shake Karadawi's home in Qatar. And, um, you know, the Sheikh is, is um, some people regard him as controversial, but he's, um, he's a great unifier. And he, I'm sure his influence um, has been positive on the Taliban and they are reaching out to the minority groups. Yeah, I, I myself have seen, I, I concur with what you said. I know that there were, uh, there were atrocities that took place. The Taliban would say that some of their own soldiers and, and members got killed, but th there's no doubt that this, there have been frictions, there was friction with Iran, um, but it's not like this this time around. They're, they've sent mm -hmm. delegations to Iran, they've sent delegations to the Hazara, they've sat with them, uh, and doing so, having done so, they've been accused and attacked by uh, groups like ISIS, K um, for doing so, for trying to reach out to them. So that's the well. ISIS K bombed a girls' school in the Hazara quarter in uh, Kabul and, and killed about um, 70, 80 girls. Um, how on earth anybody can justify that in Islam is beyond me. But the um, the Taliban condemned it uh, unconditionally. You know, they were just. Uh, they, they really condemned it. So um, I can understand the Hazaras being reluctant to believe the words um, of the leadership. 
And as I say, deeds will speak louder in, in this case, but if they do um, have Hazaras represented in the Afghan government, that would be wonderful. Okay, that's that's uh, um so another question here is do you do we know uh, what the female literacy rate was pre-occupation? Do you have any, do you have an idea? Um I don't, but it can't have been um that great if it's 84% today. Right. And and remember folks that uh, uh, pre-occupation if you, if you recall the Taliban had come to power and they'd been there for a four, about 4 5 years. But they came for a reason. It's important we understand the reason why they came into power. They didn't just come because they were seeking power. They, they, were, they had been sought uh, as students to come along and rescue people, rescue children that are being used by these warlords after the Soviet occupation who were fighting one another, uh, and these children were being used as sex slaves. So when they accused the Taliban of, you know, essentially enslaving girls and being, it, 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 it's like telling them, uh, that they are doing the very thing that they that that bought them power in the first that gave them rise in the first place. It's just hard to believe that, um, and and I, and I don't believe that at all, having lived under the uh, the them that they didn't do that. Next question is uh, Russian Mohammed asks, uh, not Russian, uh, we know but somebody else, Mohammed Chowdhury asks, what can we do as British Muslims to help, particularly uh, myself as an educator, teacher, parent of Pakistani descent? What what could anybody do to help? I, if you've got the means and, and uh, the ability to do it, I would volunteer to help. They might not want outside help. Um, I don't know. Uh, we won't really know for a few weeks. But what I do know is that there are some um, schools that have been built by the Americans, great big um, academies holding up to 2,000 pupils, and no teachers. And that, that, that was in, um, a friend of mine went to Kandahar in 2015, and uh, he, he saw this school, but it was empty, and he was saying, well, why? And they said, there are no teachers. So, okay. you know, this is something else that we're not being told. We've got about another five to ten minutes. Uh, unfortunately, Mullah Abdul Salam Zai, for whatever reason, it's hard to fathom at the moment, couldn't join us. But do not despair, guys. We have uh, access to him and others, and hopefully, inshallah, we will do this again. Um, having Sister Yvonne here has been uh, fantastic because her, her perspective is quite unique. It's different, it's fresh, uh, and it's informed. Um, people are asking, that. okay, so somebody has said, so the elephant in the room is the fact that US still has not shared or shown any factual evidence relating to 9-11 or that bin Laden had anything to do with it. What, uh, what we have are faked CIA videos of bin Laden look alike. Okay. Um, people forget that the Taliban offered to provide OBL to an international court, but the USA refused. That's true, isn't it? This is very true. They offered to hand him over to a third country. And if America showed them compelling evidence, um, that he had, uh, he was behind this crime, then uh, they were willing to do that. The Taliban bent over backwards to do anything that would prevent war. They didn't want this war. They kept saying, we don't want this war. And, and um, to the point where they were saying, show us the evidence and we will hand him over to a third country. Um, they, you know, the Americans should have listened. Correct. Uh, absolutely. They should have listened because then we wouldn't be, you wouldn't have had a 20 year cycle of war and America's reputation in the world wouldn't be uh, um, in tatters like it is now. Um, but I guess hindsight is, 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 a, is a luxury that we don't have. There's a Sahel, uh, sorry, there's a, um, okay, there's a question by Kalthum, Kalthum Khan. She says that my concern is what happens to our kids in the UK if they show support for the government or for the Taliban? That's an interesting question, because we know we've dealt with this type of thing over Palestine in the past. Mm -hmm. It is interesting. I think that um, we all probably need to wait and see uh, what sort of government, what shape of government is going to come out. 
I keep telling people I'm quietly optimistic. And uh, once we get to know what their plans are, then um, it, it will be certainly an interesting, um, an interesting thing. I think, you know, um, we, we like what they've said, but now we have to see the actions. And th this is a difficult one um, for parents because, um, the you know, with the prevent scheme and, and uh, all these uh, teachers with their uh, out of kilter radars, <laughs> it's it's very hard to know. Yeah. Okay, so here's a question that comes up often, uh, and this was about the evacuation from Kabul. As she said, uh, Aisha says that uh, I have a question that I would like to ask to pose sincerely. Um, I understand that the American occupation was absolutely horrendous, but how do you interpret the people who were desperate to leave Afghanistan? They were only the elite. Were they only the elite that benefited from the occupation? Um, you had the collaborators who had worked with the Americans and NATO forces, uh, sometimes as translators, uh, lots of different roles within um, to support the occupation. They were desperate to go because they feared reprisals. And actually, I don't blame them because it doesn't matter how disciplined the Taliban have been. It's not just the Taliban that might want their guts for garters. It could be... Uh, a brother or a wife or a husband who's seen uh, their children carted off by the Americans, who've brutalized and tortured them on information given by these collaborators. And, and um, it might, you know, the old, there will be people who think that they've got old scores to settle. Yeah. And, uh, you know, they're out of the jurisdiction of, of the control of the Taliban. So, yes, I can understand why those people fled to the airport. I can also understand economic uh, migrants who um, took their chance. There's a wonderful tale going around at the moment. I don't know how true it is. Uh, it might just be an urban myth, but... Um, there's a tale going around that a, a lorry driver from Peshawar was uh, delivering uh, something up to Kabul and he decided to go to the airport to see these scenes and got swept up in it and ended up on a transporter plane and, and rang his relatives saying, I'm in America now. I don't know how true that is. I do know that uh, there are some people um, who maybe wouldn't have qualified to go, but um, in the panic and the chaos, uh, they did get out on, on these transporter planes. So, yeah, um, I mean, I would know. just add, add to this, mm -hmm. that when we, we connect this, if we connect it to two events, one was the, when 9-11 happened, one of the most powerfully visual um, events that happened of that uh, was, was the falling, the image of the falling man, the man that's falling, and you can see him desperate um, to, to, to save himself from the fire. On the other side of this, this kind of conflict, 20 years later, it ends with three men uh, falling from an American aircraft that takes off knowing that they are attached to this plane. Um, it's, it's really shocking. But what I would add, uh, if, if we looked at Saigon or Vietnam after the, uh, the Vietnam War, I, I believe that there were about 1.6 million refugees that left. And in, in comparison, uh, this pales. Uh, also, the, the other thing is that we need to remember that the concept of the, the uh, migrants didn't start uh, with the takeover of Kabul by the Taliban. That's been going on for the past two decades. And that's with, that's what, despite the, the US occupation and the presence of, of, of uh, American troops and quote unquote, uh, mission accomplished. So it's important that we remember that this is when the media, when politicians, when leaders said, and this was what was, I remember Abdul Salam actually, Abdul Salam Zaif told me this. He said, when this um, 
the statement was given out. If you get to the airport, you get a ticket to the West. That's all it was. Um, and so if think about this. The Taliban have given amnesty to people like Abdullah Abdullah, people like Hamid Karzai, the leaders of the, of the Northern Alliance and opposition, and even released prisoners who killed Taliban members. So if that is the case, then surely the, the translators are not as dangerous as people who have killed Taliban. But I do understand what you said, that um, there, is this, th th there is this kind of um, people have a right to be afraid. I'm going to ask one more, uh, answer one more question, because I think we're going to come to an end. It's been a, been a, despite the fact, and, and again, I apologize for, to everybody who tuned in, uh, who, who was expecting, just as I was, for Abdus Salam to join us. Mm -hmm. We have been trying frantically to try to get hold of him. And uh, unfortunately, we haven't been able to. I did speak to him, I promise you, during this, as, as Yvonne was talking to us. But for whatever reason, we, it's been unable, we've been able to get hold of him. But inshallah, as I said, we will uh, next time. The, the final question I'm going to take from Abdullah Saif. He says, when will we here in the uh, Western governments and media start calling the Taliban the government of Afghanistan instead of the militant group? That's a really interesting question because... You know, how, how do they address this? Um, as soon as uh, Britain and America realize that they're losing out on a hell of a lot of trade um, in Afghanistan, because while the Taliban have been networking within Afghanistan, they've also um, been talking business with their neighbors, including Iran, uh, Pakistan, China, Russia, Turkey, obviously Qatar is, is at the heart of all of this. And that would be one incredible trading block, the revival of the old Silk Road route. And Afghanistan is rich in natural resources. And uh, this has not been lost on the Chinese who I think of, uh, will support the uh, Taliban and help them financially. And I think um, the West will realize that it, it, if it wants to be part of this, it has to start talking. And we all know that um, money talks, especially in, in, the, in the West. And so um, they will, uh, I've got no doubt, be knocking on the door for business because um, especially since Brexit, you know, there's, uh, there's only one trade deal on the go and that was the Australian trade deal, which has been a nightmare. So I, I think Britain will be knocking on the door quite soon. America, I think uh, we're seeing a superpower in decline now. Uh, psychologically, they were damaged after 9-11. This crushing military defeat, and make no doubt about it, it is a crushing military defeat, will have further psychologically damaged them. And I think that uh, they are going to become um, more withdrawn on the global uh, stage. And I, I think that this will reshape their foreign policy, which would be no bad thing. You just reminded me of a, a famous statement by Lord Palmerston um, from 1852, was a senior British politician who eventually became the prime minister. He said, we have no perpetual em enemies. We have no eternal friends. Only our interests are perpetual and eternal. And is that that we will follow? So I, I'm, I'm completely sure that that's what this is all gonna be about for, for, for Western nations and they will call the Taliban, the Afghan government, and anything else if it, if it fills their pockets. Um, uh, we've run out of time, unfortunately. I just want to say one thing for me as, on a personal level. When I saw the images of the Taliban soldiers walking into Bagram, it, I broke down. And it, memories came flooding back to me about what I witnessed there and what, I, what happened there in those years. And I, I've never been able to forget that. Uh, it's easier for me to forget Guantanamo than to forget Bagram. I can't forget it. And I went back to Pakistan to the house that I was abducted from with Yvonne. And she filmed me and she, she saw my reaction to being in that house, going to that place. 
and, and she made a film called The Return. Um, I'm hoping, though I think it'd be deeply, deeply painful, um, that one day, soon enough, we can go back and film The Return Part Two, mm -hmm. where um, we uncover and speak about what I believe is the scene of a crime that still remains unsolved. So brothers and sisters, uh, thank you, Sister Yvonne, for joining us. It's been a pleasure, absolute pleasure. Your, your insight and understanding uh, is, is, is unique and fresh. And I hope again that we can join, be joined next time by um, Abdus Salam Zaif and perhaps Inshallah. other members, other members of, of the Taliban, perhaps Sahel Shaheen, who also um, had some words to say about you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> But we'll, we'll leave that for, for everyone's thoughts uh, for, uh, for later. Again, brothers mm -hmm. and sisters, if you uh, uh, do uh, want to know more about the work of we're doing, what we're doing particularly, as I said, we have the International Witness Campaign. Uh, please do log on to the website for that. Uh, it has already started its launch and we've got several um, aspects of that book which will we be taking place over the next five months between now and the anniversary, the 20th anniversary since Guantanamo was open. Sister Yvonne, inshallah, will take part in, in some of those things as well as other journalists and uh, academics and former prisoners and former soldiers. So please keep tuned. Uh, Jazakallah khair once, once again to everyone. Uh, 